Hello and welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. I'm Sarah. And I'm Rick. And today we're going to talk about some mead that Rick has just made. Um, this is a recipe we've been hoping to do for a number of years <laughs> and uh, finally made time to do it. Um, I don't know what our, you know, why we didn't do it before. It was like a mental block. I kind of felt like it was going to be more complicated, but then it ended up maybe not being that complicated. That That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> I thought it was going to be harder than it really is. And mm. then it kind of was out of sight, out of mind. Got some local honey from a neighbor and things came up. And, and when we were recently mm -hmm. doing our big clean out this past August, we found the uh, honey. Yep. And it's one of the wonderful things about honey is there really isn't that. Uh, there's a very long shelf life for it. it can grow. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't go bad, so it has natural um, antibiotical properties and mm -hmm. um, the sugar content, and it keeps it from going stale, so you can just use it. Right, which is also what makes it easy to make mead, from what I can see. Mm -hmm. So we're going to walk you through how to make a mead, even though we technically, as we're recording this, are still in the process of making said mead. Uh, it's cooling down over here. We haven't even pitched the yeast but it's been, a, it's been a fun experience. It's a really simple recipe, uh, but access to local honey is the best part of it. If you have access to local honey, and you really should just, might not, it might be hiding in plain sight, but it's probably mm -hmm. there, local farmers markets, et cetera. Yep. Get, um, get some local honey and you can make as much or as little as you want. Uh, this recipe that we're working on is a five gallon batch because we are also going to be splitting it up into right. two recipes. Yep. So um, mead is a stronger beverage than your typical pale ale. It usually has a higher alco alcohol content. So, um, and it takes a long time to brew. So there's a payoff if you are patient and you get a nice high alcohol drink that will also be shelf stable for quite a while. Um, but putting that much time and investment in means we're going to make a bigger batch, even though. Um, we're not huge mead drinkers. We do like it. Um, we just don't have a, a meadery close by. So making your own is another great way to, to you know, have access to this drink. If if you're not me near a fermentary, that, that makes it. Yeah. Mead's made to be shared. So you Absolutely. can have mead. Uh, we're making this now with the anticipation of having it ready for the fall, winter holidays for next year. Mm -hmm. So we started it today and we will allow it to ferment out, as Sarah said, for a long period of time because your patient will be rewarded. Yeah, yeah, it's usually about eight to 12 months, right, for fermentation period. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so give us an overview. Besides honey, what are we looking at for uh, ingredients or steps? Well, I mean, you could be as simple as just making honey. Uh, in most of the recipes that I've found, you're just dissolving the honey in warm water in order to just kind of get it all mixed up together. As Sarah said earlier, it's got its own natural preservative, uh, preservatives in it. You really don't have to worry about boiling it like you would with a beer, with the malts in a beer. Uh, mm -hmm. With the honey, it's really going to be just kind of just warm it up, dissolve it, add some yeast or not. That's what I'm saying. You could just technically leave this open or use the natural fermentation if you wanted to. Oh, okay. And do you know, would you get like a more sour flavor that way? Because often with beer, if you do an open fermentation, you'll get more of a tangy taste. It will, it'll all depend mm -hmm. on your, the flora in your, wherever you happen to leave it open, um, mm -hmm. whenever that may be. And that's the case. If you don't actually know, it might be a crapshoot, but, or you could split off a section and put that out and set it aside and right. perhaps make a small batch or a gallon to see how that works out. Mm -hmm. But in this recipe or the way we've done it is I've actually heated the honey up to about 160. The idea is that I want to give our yeast, the yeast that we're going to, that we bought, the dry yeast, uh, a chance to kind of overpower any wild yeast. Mm -hmm. So to give it a good head start. So there's a natural, or excuse me, there's a dry yeast packet. We use two, just warmed them up with about 100 degrees Fahrenheit water, uh, allowed that just to kind of warm up. And then that'll get pitched with also about a, a quarter teaspoon of some yeast nutrient. And that is the idea is to give it the yeast we're introducing 
the one that we want to use to provide the flavors for this mead, we're introducing it and allowing it to overpower any natural ones that might be available during the process or might come in during the process. Right, because I think some of those wild yeasts, they can, again, impart that tang, or you can get things like lactobacillus in there that are a bacteria, not even a yeast, mm -hmm. and then, you know, those can go crazy, and you're then now you're suddenly you're making more of a kombucha than a mead. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I really want that dry, you know, champagne kind of taste. I really like that. Not very sweet. Um, and again, the long fermentation process will help you get a drier and drier um, yeah. beverage. Right. And as I was saying before, I asked Sarah to talk about, we're splitting this off into two batches. So mm -hmm. one is going to be just the local honey with this particular kind of, sh I think it's a champagne or a wine yeast or white mm -hmm. wine yeast. That will be by itself. And then the other? Um, the other is going to be elderberry juice. Um, my mother and I, over the summer, collected el elderberries from a friend of ours who has a big berry patch. And our original idea was to use some of those for dyeing, but um, I did some more reading and found out that the elderberry juice is not a stable dye. It does not, the color doesn't um, hang around, especially when it's exposed to light. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's really not viable. So mom's been making elderberry syrup for us, which is a great tonic. It's actually been clinically proven to shorten um, illness. Like if you think you're going to come down with a cold or something, it shortens those um, viral uh, seasonal things that you can get, those little bugs that go around. And um, that's actually uh, helped me a lot um, this fall, mm -hmm. going to all these fiber festivals and <laughs> other events. Um and it, and it tastes good, you know, it's sweet and it tastes <laughs> That's like berry juice. I was juice, just going you know? to interject and say it doesn't but... work and it really tastes. Because she also <laughs> uses honey in hers. Right, to, to make it, that, yeah. Right, essentially mm -hmm. to sweeten it a bit, but also to give it a shelf life and allow it to have a natural yeah. preservative yeah. into it without having to add anything to it. Right, so just the elderberry juice by itself is not shelf stable. It would probably mold off in a, in a day or two um, mm -hmm. to start to spoil. But um, adding that to into the mead after it's had a chance to ferment for a while mm -hmm. um, gives will give the mead a nice berry flavor, a nice blush um, color, and um, it will also, it also means that the juice is um, not going to go bad because it's in with all that honey and the fermentation process. Like you said, the yeast is taking over there, so you're mm -hmm. not going to get cooties <laughs> in, your, in your final beverage. Right, so they'll be split yeah. off. The second one, because it has fruit, is technically a melamel. Uh, which means that you, know, you have a, a fruit added to it. So what at the time we do that, you're also introducing a lot more sugars, mm -hmm. and there may or may not be enough yeast power there to take on the sugars. So uh, we'll add a we'll add some yeast nutrient at that point as well to try and get that yeast to be able to munch through some of those extra sugars. Uh, we mm -hmm. want it to be a little sweet, but we don't want it to be uh, overpoweringly sweet, and we mm -hmm. want to make sure that all those sugars are kind of fermented out. Right. Processed out there. Yeah. yeah, it's going to give us our alcohol and our bubbles. Yeah. Bubbles, we like. We like bubbles. I like bubbly beverages. <laughs> cool. Um, so we won't be able to taste this on camera for quite a while. Um, we might post some updates, probably just to Instagram. We might post some some photos when we do the melamel process in about a month from now, mm -hmm. um, and just you know mention it every once in a while throughout the year. But um, tune back in next fall, <laughs> and we should hopefully have some mead to share with you. Um, meanwhile, you can get the step-by-step -step instructions for this recipe on the blog. The link for that will be in the show notes. Um, and yeah, is there anything else you wanted to say about the mead? No, just the again, process? it's another thing you can buy from your local farmer. and The, the honey. The yeah. honey, exactly. The bees mm -hmm. are there to help the farms uh, essentially with the pollination. We encourage that. We encourage people to keep bees and this is what happens when you keep bees. You have honey, and there are a lot of good things you can do with honey, including a very simple fermented beverage that mm -hmm. has, goes back for millennia. Right. It's an ancient a, uh, ancient beverage, and it is easier than, uh, than making beer. Um, so if you haven't done any fermentable beverages or if you haven't done beer yet and you're a little intimidated by all the different steps and you know timing and adding ingredients through the process, this might be a good place to start too. Yeah, exactly. Although you shouldn't be overwhelmed by brewing beer, but that's <laughs> no. okay. But you know, Sarah is correct. This is stovetop stuff that you don't need special ingredients for. 
I mean, ideally you should have a fermentation bucket or a, a glass carboy, which is what we're going to be using. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you really do need, should have those tools anyway. And the nice thing about them is they do allow you to do a variety of beverages, mm -hmm. the beers, the wines, the meads, the ciders, anything you want to do. Once you have the hardware, then the software, the recipes that you make with the variety of uh, uh, ingredients that can be reused or made over and over. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. cool. So get out there and brew some mead. Um, I also want to mention that we are wearing some of my own knitting pattern designs. So if you are a knitter, um, we have the Bethel hats um, with an I are each wearing one, different colors. And um, the matching Bethel mitts just came out a couple of days ago. So now you can be matchy-matchy with your textured stuff. Um, and I'll, again, include a link in the uh, below the YouTube video to the Ravelry pattern page where you can get both of these. So thanks again for joining us, and uh, tune in next time. I'm hoping to, again, provide some more interviews. It's been tough scheduling people, but um, we'll get back on that train soon, I hope. In the meantime, uh, we've got ideas for a few more recipes for you, too. So stay tuned. Happy holidays, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Take care.